I'm going to have each panelist uh, speak for a couple minutes about their company and really want you guys to talk about the perspective from your astronaut training and also safety program. What is that like and what can future folks like all of us look forward to and also safety program? What is that like and what can future folks like all of us look forward to if we were to fly on each of your vehicles. So I'll have you guys speak for a little bit on that, and then at the end, uh, we have a fun surprise for you guys all as well, so stick around. I'm gonna have Richard speak first. Okay, well, it's great to be here today. I think I have some slides, which I promise I'll click through very quickly. Um, just a quick profile here. We have an air launch system that is designed to take a spaceship up to about 40,000 feet, then the engine ignites, flies to space, provides, uh, flies to about 100 kilometers, provides a, a brilliant view of the Earth and about four minutes of microgravity, and then glides down to Earth. That's the overview. So just to sort of show that in, in real life pictures, this is the White Knight, which is the carrier vehicle carrying the, the spaceship. Uh, the next slide shows that once they get to altitude, they do the, the spaceship drops. Uh, the engine then ignites, burns for about three minutes, uh, goes up to about 100 kilometers, um, and then you would get this view uh, as you were floating in space. And then uh, the, the spacecraft deploys its tail up, which acts a little bit like a badminton cock in that it orients the spacecraft back down to Earth and also bleeds off some of the energy. Um, that then the, when you get down to about 30,000 foot, the tail uh, straightens out again and it glides down like a glider and lands uh, on a runway. Uh, commercial operation, although testing today is being done in Mojave, California, commercial operations will be at our spaceport uh, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we hope to be moving there next year. Um, we're also doing some research, which is not really relevant to this topic except well, it has, if you can see, we can reorient the cockpit to allow there to be a payload specialist who would actually fly with uh, the research mission. And so we are, what's going on in the program? We are finishing our glide flight test. We're about to begin powered flight, um, which means we actually light the engine this time. And uh, then we're just gonna move the team down to New Mexico and, and to begin commercial operations. So that's a quick, very quick overview of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think um, uh, the, just to say a few words, um, actually, Grana, you, you did acknowledge that we have been working together for years with NASCAR and some of our early um, uh, future, we call them future astronauts or space flight participants. Uh, some of our early customers uh, have gone through the NASCAR program and have experienced uh, uh, increased Gs of, uh, of uh, uh, that come with that program in the centrifuge. And we also will have, uh, the typical profile will be that a, uh, a customer will come three or four days before the flight. There'll be a three-day uh, training program. There'll be a familiarization with the aircraft and all the systems. There will be a, uh, they will meet their crew. They will meet their fellow passengers. Um, they will, of course, get fitted for a very snazzy-looking Virgin uh, uh, flight suit. And uh, they will actually, they'll have interviews, a consulta private consultations and medical screening will all happen in that period. Um, there'll be a mock-up on the ground of the spaceship, which they will uh, work in to understand the whole flight profile so that they understand when they can get out of their seat during the flight. And, and this, um, this process, hopefully, uh, we, we uh, will be starting next year. And um, I don't want to consume all the time, so I'll just be quiet and pass it to Ariane. Ariane, would you care to share the details of Blue Origin? Sure, my pleasure. Well, thank you, Brianna, for the invitation to share a little bit about uh, our astronaut program, uh, some of the developments. But maybe I should start with, with Blue Origin. Our vision is millions of people living and working in space. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen tomorrow. We recognize that. Uh, our motto at Blue Origin is Gordatum Ferocitor, or step-by-step step ferociously. 
And so the, the first and, and very important step in that is our suborbital program and our suborbital rocket, New Shepard. Um, I hope you all have seen uh, our, our launches and, and webcasts and videos that we've put out um, because we're very proud of the system. Um, uh, New Shepard was the first rocket to fly into space over 100 kilometers uh, and to come back and land. You see, this is our flight from November of 2015, the first time that we did that. Um, but just as importantly, if not more importantly, that same piece of hardware flew four more subsequent times for a total of five flights on this rocket. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're very proud of that fact. Um, but that's, that, is, that is step one, and then the next step is ultimately we'll be flying people on this rocket. We're already flying um, payloads, but we will be putting people on this rocket uh, in the next year or two. Uh, so what does that flight look like? Uh, the, the capsule sits on top of the booster. Uh, the, the two lift off, uh, and at about uh, 75 kilometers, the uh, capsule separates from the booster. And right about there is where you're going to start to feel your, your zero Gs. So you're going to continue uh, up over 100 kilometers. Uh, and we're going to let you unbuckle, get out of your seat. Uh, there are six seats, six windows. You see those windows? They're the, those are the largest windows that will have ever flown in space. Uh, over a third of the capsule. Uh, is, is windows, so you know, when you're flight, floating in space and doing some somersaults, uh, you're going to feel like you are flowing, uh, floating in space. Um, uh, I will also, uh, if you note here, some of the seats that are in there, those are in-house designs to seat, seats. They're based on a, a helicopter model. Um, you're in a reclined position. Um, that's really nice when you're, uh, when you're taking the Gs on the way up, you max it about three Gs on the way up and about 5Gs uh, just momentarily on the way down. So it's nice that it disperses those Gs. The uh, booster is going to race you back home. So uh, uh, New Shepard comes in, those drag brakes at the, at the top end pop out at about 20,000 feet. At about 3,600 feet, the uh, BE3 engine relights. Uh, it's a deeply throttleable uh, LOX hydrogen engine, and it comes in for a very nice soft landing. Uh, Meantime, you will still be floating up there. It's a full 11 minute flight, but at Apogee, about uh, four minutes of which is when you're gonna get your zero G experience. Uh, we're gonna get you back in your seat. You're gonna come down under uh, three parachutes. And just at the last second, uh, our retro thrust system at the base of the capsule will fire uh, to slow down your landing to just about uh, one or two miles per hour. So in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively soft landing. It kicks up dust uh, out at our site in West Texas, um, but it's, a, it's a, a nice soft landing, especially with those seats that I mentioned. So uh, we are looking forward to flying the next, uh, the next tail of, uh, of New Shepard by the end of the year. Um, this, uh, we're excited about this new, this new rocket, um, but also we're excited about the new capsule because the, uh, the next capsule will actually have the windows on it. Uh, if you've seen our flights before, those windows were just painted on so you can see uh, just the relative scale of, of those uh, ginormous windows. Um, but we are, uh, it's a really important next step. Um, when it comes to the training program, uh, uh, you know, if you were to come fly with us on a Wednesday, You'd, uh, you'd fly into West Texas about a day and a half in advance, uh, get to meet the, the rest of your um, of the, the passengers that will be flying with you, as well as the origin team that's going to be training you uh, on the day before flight. So it'll be one day of uh, intense but fun, uh, of, uh, intense but fun training. Um, the uh, we're going to go over, of course, ingress, egress, uh, emergency procedures. Uh, we want to make sure that our customers uh, feel, uh, feel comfortable uh, for, for anything that might happen. Uh, we also go over what we call zero-G etiquette, uh, making sure that, uh, uh, that you have a comfortable flight as well as your, uh, your crewmates. Uh, I should note, as you saw there in the video, uh, you will be in a, a flight suit. It's not a, it's not a pressure suit. It's a shirt sleeve environment. Um, you won't be you won't be wearing uh, shoes like this. I can get a little uh, out of hand. We'll give you some nice soft shoes um, in addition to teaching you about zero-g etiquette. 
Uh, and so that's, that, that's the, the key behind our, our training program. Um, it's compact. We think it's going to cover exactly what you need for the, uh, for the 11 minutes. And to tie it back to this idea of millions of people living and working in space, we're, we're working on a rocket. You might have heard about uh, this operational reusability that we build into the rocket. But also from the perspective of flying people, how do we get that process down to, uh, you know, as Rich mentioned as well, um, so that we can democratize space, we can open it up um, to, to millions of people. And that also is how uh, we, we build it into the, the training program as well. Um, uh, so that's, that's the overview. Uh, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. We just so just to recap very briefly, um, um, the blue is in five of 11 minutes, and the training program will start about a day and a half ahead of time, correct? Right. And the Virgin Galactic flight is about two hours? It's about two hours from takeoff to landing. Two hours or so uh, from takeoff to landing, and then um, the, the training will start about three days ahead of time. Yes, three days. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Chris. Okay, uh, so we've heard from two of our uh, suborbital um, uh, ways to space. Uh, uh, Boeing's offering is, is a little bit different in that we're serving our flagship customer, which is NASA. So in, in essence, Boeing is building a spacecraft that performs the function that the space shuttle did a few short years ago to take American and international partner astronauts to the International Space Station and return them six months later. So it's fully orbital flight. Uh, zero G doesn't last four minutes. It lasts as long as you want it to until you do a deorbit burn and return back. And it will be getting ready uh, for, uh, for space flight next year. So let's, uh, let's tell you a little bit about where we are. Uh, first, some of Boeing's model in space, you know, just because you've done something in the past doesn't entitle you to continue to do it in the future, but Boeing and its heritage companies have been involved in human, human space flights since, uh, well, since there was human space flight, uh, back from the days of the X-15, and then you see is the latter end of the, uh, the uh, timeline there, uh, SLS Space Launch System, which will ultimately be the lift vehicle that takes us to Mars and beyond. Uh, the Starliner, which is uh, which is our program that we're talking about here, and then the next step, which is that intermediate um, uh, waypoint in route to Mars. But uh, we've, we've been in this business a long time, and we've realized that there's a lot of new entrants in in the club, and it just it doesn't entitle us to do it forever. But uh, but we intend to remain here as we have in the past. Um, the Starliner will launch uh, on an Atlas V uh, vehicle. Atlas V has been. Uh, very successfully serving uh, the world for uh, for about 17 years now. It's got uh, close to 80 uh, successful flights uh, under its belt. Just uh, last week, it launched Enrol 42 out of the west coast of the United States, a uh, reconnaissance satellite. Uh, and it's uh, it, the vehicle itself, the spacecraft itself, is designed for seven people. Um, we we built it ultimately to carry five because the NASA mission only wants four. So that extra seat, that fifth seat, can be used for either uh, cargo or perhaps for a paying passenger. And of course, we need to work very closely with our International Space Station partners, which ultimately is our destination, to coordinate and make sure that they would welcome spaceflight participants or perhaps international partner astronauts uh, on board as well. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a contract right now with NASA to conduct a full uh, cradle-to-grave uh, program. We're doing full development of the, of the spacecraft, right? the payload that takes the astronauts to the space station. Uh, and uh, to integrate that with the Atlas V launch vehicle, there will be some minor modifications to the Atlas V, and that includes the incorporation of, uh, of an emergency detection system that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, our requirements are, as I said, to deliver NASA astronauts to space. So our training program is a little bit different. It's a little bit longer, uh, and uh, we keep in mind that the astronauts that we are training are predominantly training to perform a six-month mission on the space station, and that our ride that we provide to them is really just a function that gets them there and gets them back, so we try to keep it fairly concise. And you can see our timeline there. Uh, we're busy. Uh, we're in the, the thick of testing right now with the intent of uh, flying uh, at least uh, our uncrewed test flight next year and, and ideally both our uncrewed and our crewed test flight. Uh, we are uh, we're building the modules in a former shuttle processing facility uh, on the eastern coast of Florida by the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we're doing our testing all over the United States, and we'll mention just a little bit about that in a moment. And uh, we intend to train, fully train the astronauts at the Johnson Space Center, so it'll be a very familiar astronaut or uh, training environment for uh, for astronauts as it was for me and Tony in our in our former lives. And uh, um, 
Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> Draw the blank. That, no, but actually, this is. Uh, I, I did find that there is a future for uh, for retired astronauts, and it, it is it is in the function of press test, uh, dummy testing. But what you're seeing here is, uh, and Tony, I, I reserve that job for you. But it did take me about a week to get that little uh, orange and black dot off my forehead. Um, but uh, what you're seeing here is, is a part of our end-to-end -end, uh, safety testing. That, again, this is mandated by NASA. Uh, we do land on land, like our predecessors. We don't, uh, not on a runway, but we do actually cushion our final landing, unlike uh, a retro-type system that Blue Origin uses. Uh, we use airbags to cushion the final landing, but we all must, we must be prepared for about any surface that could be underneath us. So we, we, we have unusual attitudes that we could prepare for. We could even land in water if we have to. We never uh, designed the vehicle to do so. Uh, but we did a lot of testing to make sure that there's no flail injury for the, uh, for the participant. Um, let's see. Uh, we mentioned training. We a lot of emphasis on training. Uh, unlike some of the suborbital um, entrants in this business, our, our training program is, is a little deeper uh, because, again, uh, we're training them to be the commander of the crew. Uh, the vehicle is really autonomous, so it, it can actually seek and find and dock with the International Space Station autonomously, but NASA has been kind enough to bestow a requirement on us that the astronaut must be able to uh, take over from the automation at any time and successfully execute the balance of the mission. So in many ways, that actually makes it more challenging in that the astronaut not only has to understand what has to be done to do the job, but has to understand how the automation intends to do the job. And that's why we have our training facilities at the Johnson Space Center. We have two park test trainers that are largely uh, touchscreen based. You see Eric Bowe working one of them in the upper left and the lower left. We have a full-up mission simulator that gives the astronauts that full-up immersive experience that they would have, including sound and, uh, and, and tactile feel and a full environment uh, that you would expect inside, uh, inside the vehicle. Uh, we have a mock-up so they can practice insertion and extraction activities, emergency egress activities, uh, and we even built a, a boilerplate mock-up to serve just in case we land in the water uh, so that the government rescue forces can, uh, can rescue the crew. Uh, a lot of maturity right now in terms of uh, testing. We're, uh, we're, we're testing coast to coast uh, in, in the, uh, the right image. This is the first time we've actually joined the crew module uh, to the service module at, at our West Coast facility, and we're going through modal testing right now. Uh, our uh, thrusters are being tested at the White Sand Test Facility, uh, as you see in the center. Off to the left, uh, we are uh, in the middle of what we call parachute system qualification test, uh, where we drag a, uh, one of our boilerplate test articles up to 40,000 feet under a helium balloon, release it, and let it go through uh, all of the recovery activities uh, all the way to landing. And then, uh, as you see in the chart, we have a fairly significant test next year, a pad abort test, and we'll conduct that at the White Sands Test Facility. So it's a very busy year of testing for us. Uh, again, the focus is on safety, a lot of safety enhancements. I mentioned one of them earlier called the Emergency Detection System. It's one of the modifications that we made to the Atlas V. It's essentially a, a self-testing diagnostic um, capability that measures how the booster rocket is performing. And if anything should uh, go awry very quickly, there will not be enough time for the crew to react themselves. So we will, in effect, use our abort system. Uh, the, uh, the launch vehicle will tell the crew module to abort, and uh, at which time it will uh, use the equivalent of an ejection seat for a rocket to propel itself away to land safely in the water where it can be recovered by, uh, by government rescue crews. Um, I, of course, uh, with that is the, is the full-up launch abort system. It's a pusher abort system. It consists of four liquid-powered uh, engines that can propel us away uh, if, uh, if need be. We also have an evacuation system on the, uh, on the launch pad, and then we're designed for landing in all sorts of environments, ideally on land, but uh, potentially uh, in water as well. Um, I mentioned NASA is our flagship customer, and uh, our primary objective is to get them back and forth to the space station. There are potential business opportunities that uh, lie in the future, but, uh, but we're going to get, uh, get our, uh, our primary customers going uh, before we uh, embark on that. And I promise this is just a short, and there's some audio with this if you want to turn it up. If not, you're going to have to listen to me the whole time. Very good. At this point, we are witnessing something that we're all going to remember decades from now. This is a point in history that reflects a new era in human spaceflight.
I know many of you have had the opportunity to dock our simulator outside. It's actually that easy in real life, so uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you on board someday. Thanks. Thank you. That was a big, great video, Chris. Um, I'm excited. Who's hands up? Who wants to go? Should we go now? Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Um, and uh, so one question for you uh, here. Um, you mentioned there's a fifth seat, right? We're all interested in that fifth seat. Um, who can fulfill that fifth seat? International? Domestic? How are you going to pick that? Uh, well, it's a great question. A, a lot of it actually depends on our ISS partner. And, and, and why I say that is because we, um, we ideally don't want to send the fifth seat customer up to the International Space Station for a full six months, nor do I think the ISS wants them for a full six months. So the idea is to get them up there, allow them to experience a couple weeks of, uh, of International Space Station life and bring them back home again. So uh, the question is, how are we going to alternate vehicles? Of course, we're not the only one in this business. SpaceX is also in this business. So what we call a direct handover, all right, our ability to go up, allow someone to spend some time, and then bring them down uh, on, a, uh, on a different vehicle so we limit their time on board is probably going to drive who occupies, uh, who occupies that seat. So, uh, it, it, but otherwise, uh, it's for sale, Brianna. I don't know if you're into, uh, if you're into this kind of thing. I certainly am. But, uh, but everything has its price, and if we don't take a passenger, we'll take cargo. Uh, but the nice thing is, it's an enticement, it's out there, there are, uh, there are there's interest, uh, not only within the United States, but across the globe, and we'd love to fill that seat with, uh, with a passenger, a, I'll call them a space flight participant, uh, soon uh, on a trip up to the ISS. Ah, good question. So would they still be a space flight participant if they pick the fifth seat? Uh, that's a good question. We'll work that. <laughs> we'll get that details out later. I'll have George fill that one. All right, Tony. Who here wants to fly in space? All right, not not everybody's hands up, uh, which is okay. Uh, I will tell you though that uh, NASA, uh, so far, ESA, JAXA, Roscosmos, they're not picking anybody that doesn't raise their hand. Um, I know, from Virgin's standpoint, they're not picking anybody that doesn't. They didn't put down a deposit, but so one of those things, right? You're you're going to have to do if you really want to go. If you don't want to go, you know, sitting on your hands is a is a safe move. Uh, for those of you that do want to go, um, what what's it about flying in space? It, it, who here wants to ride a rocket ship? Wow, that that was um, that was more than I thought. Um, I suggest you guys uh, go back and look at. Uh, a modern rocketry. Anyway, uh, moving on. <laughs> Who here uh, wants to experience weightlessness? Float, fly, you saw the video. Yeah, that's a good number. It turns out, I don't know, uh, I haven't asked Fergie and Pambo, that's one of the coolest parts about uh, space flight. Uh, that was the most surprising. I have no idea why floating and flying is so much fun, but it's, uh, but it's just, just terrific. All right. Um, uh, let's see, who wants to uh, look down upon Earth from, from space? Yeah, that, sh that should be everybody. Even if you don't want to fly in space, you should still want to do that. It's uh, fantastic. Um, who wants to uh, set foot on another world? Moon, Mars, anywhere else? And then the last one, who wants to survive the return trip back to Earth to live <laughs> and tell? and tell about their journey, right? That's a key piece. Uh, so it turns out uh, Lockheed Martin uh, is uh, the industry partner with NASA building the Orion spacecraft. Uh, we got uh, EM-1, Exploration Mission 1, and uncrewed test flight uh, coming up real soon, and then we'll switch to, uh, to crewed flights. They're going to go out past the moon. So uh, farther than, uh, than humans have traveled, uh, another uh, 40, 70,000 kilometers uh, farther than the, than the Apollo uh, missions went. Uh, and then uh, we're going to build up uh, NASA's Deep Space Gateway. Uh, Fergie had on his charts, it was called uh, Next Step. They're, they're kind of this, uh, synonymous. Uh, we're going to build a cislunar uh, Deep Space Gateway so that we can build up the infrastructure and the operational experience uh, to build up the deep space transport to go on to trips to Mars. 
uh, trip, round trip to Mars, you're talking about three years. So I, I know the, the two questions that are coming, right? How long are you going to experience weightlessness? Uh, for these first missions, orbiting uh, Mars Science Laboratory, like three years of weightlessness. And then how long's the training? That's the second question, right? It is your entire life. So uh, it's everything you've done to date, and it's everything you're going to do before you go on this mission. Who here's changed a, a flat tire on their bicycle or car? Yeah, so that's part of your training. You're going to need those kind of skills to be able to do this kind of mission. Another key piece of an orbiting science laboratory in Mars orbit is low latency telerobotics, right? You can drive the rovers now from orbit with just a short enough delay that will enable you to do all kinds of scientific exploration at a pace that in six to nine months in Mars orbit, you can do more Mars science than we've done in 40 years on the surface of Mars. However, here's the key piece. You gotta bring the scientific minds, kind of scientific method to Mars orbit, or you're not gonna take advantage of the low latency, right? So, you gotta, uh, you gotta know how to change a flat tire, as well as, and, and that's my uh, analogy for repairing anything on board, right? All of the systems on board are gonna need preventative maintenance. That's gonna be a regular part of the trip. Uh, Three-year trip in weightlessness is gonna require uh, physical fitness training. So not just training to go on the mission, but, but during the mission. And guess what? If the exercise equipment breaks, we're, you're not getting new pieces, right? You're gonna to have to figure out a way to fix what you have with what you have. Um, the mission's gonna be international. So who here speaks a second language so far? All right, again, that the part of your lives that you spent learning a second language, that's part of the training for this mission. Um, and then uh, the last piece, uh, and, uh, and the most important, because I didn't see anybody that was raising their hands for the first set of questions. If you raise your hand for the last question, right, you want to return alive back on Earth and tell the tale of your adventure, you've got to be ready to deal with whatever contingencies happen during this emergency, right? So Orion is designed uh, with uh, strict NASA standards for human rating requirements for deep space, including radiation storm shelter and things that we just never designed in the spacecraft uh, before Orion. Uh, so she's equipped to keep you alive for weeks and uh, keep you safe and allow you the time uh, to figure out whatever contingency situation presents itself on your three-year mission. I'm convinced it's not going to be if you have one. I'm convinced it's going to be when and, and which type uh, on, a, on a deep space mission of that length. Uh, so you've got to be ready to, uh, to solve real-world problems with a ticking clock. And so same thing. Everything you've done your whole life uh, would prepare you uh, for this mission. I know Rich thinks you can't go, right? He thinks, uh, and I, somebody used the word normal people. I can't remember who used that. I, can, I consider myself a normal person. Um, normal people can go into outer space. Fergie, Pam, are you all normal or you're not sure? So, so. Um, this is something you can do, right? Uh, uh, depending on where you are in your career, this is, uh, uh, certainly opening up space tourism to a broader population uh, is really going to ignite the excitement of space travel. Looking down at Earth from 100 kilometers is going to change your perspective of Earth in, in ways that you probably won't really understand until you experience them. And then having, uh, and I don't get to pick, I know you, all, you were raising your hand for me, I don't get to pick which one of you gets to set foot on Mars. Uh, but that's going to be game-changing for, for all of us. Um, and so, uh, especially for the students, right, focusing uh, on the STEM subjects. Uh, again, everything you do your whole life will be training for this mission. And uh, don't be shy about raising your hand. Um, if you want to hear more about this Mars Base Camp uh, vision, it'll be uh, uh, early Friday morning uh, right here in, uh, in uh, C. 
So, uh, so come back, come back Friday morning, and we'll tell you more about uh, Mars Base Camp. Thanks so much. Man. Tony answered all our questions, so thank you, Tony. Uh, let's hear from George. Uh, if you, George, if you, we've kind of increased in um, risk a little bit as uh, Tony uh, then explained some of the other dangers, especially uh, reentry and radiation, etc. But uh, maybe you can talk about the regulatory environment a little bit and uh, and some of these safety risks. Sure, be happy to. This is a really exciting time for commercial space transportation. In fact, I think we're coming up on what may someday be referred to as a golden age of human spaceflight. One of the reasons for that is we're in the middle of a significant transformation between a time when the government did it all, pretty much, to a time when private industry is playing an increasingly important role. And just look at what's happening right now. There are six, count them, human-rated spacecraft under development. We've heard about several of them here, but there's a couple others. Lockheed's Orion, Boeing, Starliner 100, got the SpaceX Dragon, Sierra Nevada, Dream Chaser, we've got Blue Origins, New Shepard, and Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2. All under development now. Pretty exciting time. But as we do that, I think it'll be important for us to keep in mind some observations from our Congress in the U.S., which is space transportation, is inherently risky and the future of the industry is going to depend on our ability to continually improve the safety performance. So take a look at the record now. In the U.S. we have had 375 human space flights over the years and four of those, one X-15, two shuttle, and one spaceship two, have ended in a fatal accident. So that's about a 1% fatal accident rate, about 10,000 times more risky than the record of a typical commercial airliner. So that's something we want to improve upon. If you look at the human spaceflight regulations that we've got at the FAA, it's pretty much a, a very concise, top-level performance-based set of regulations. Pilots need to have an FAA pilot's license with an instrument rating, plus the, the knowledge and experience to control the vehicle. Safety critical members of the flight crew need to have at least a second class FAA medical. Space flight participants fly under informed consent, so they have to understand the risk that they're taking and sign on the dotted line that they're willing to accept those risks. Although not it's currently required, we're encouraging designers, developers, the operators of these systems to at least think through all of the recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety that we put out in a publication a few years back. So we've identified some important areas for the companies to think about and decide how they want to address. If you look at the overall process of regulatory oversight right now, FAA licenses but basically only focuses on keeping this uninvolved public safe. In the future, when Congress repeals the, the moratorium on new regulations and we have industry consensus standards in place, I think we could well see occupant safety as part of the overall license. Way downstream, once spaceflight becomes more routine and we have a lot more data to deal with, I think it's likely we'll end up with some kind of a certification process similar to what we have in aviation. I, frankly, I think that's decades away right now. Meanwhile, there's companies not just building rockets, but doing training. And Brianna talked about some of those. NASCAR's got a centrifuge. You can go altitude chamber training. You can buy a ticket to fly parabolic aircraft trajectories to experience weightlessness about 30 seconds at a time. You can even sign up with Waypoint to Space and try on a spacesuit and see what a, an EPA might be all about. An important part of training at NASA has always been their T-38 program where both pilots and mission specialists got frequent flights in a high-performance aircraft. Well, I'll tell you, there are private individuals and companies right now that have high-performance aircraft. The catch is that under current U.S. law and regulation, you can't use those aircraft in a training mission for spaceflight and have 
compensation or higher. They're considered experimental aircraft, and that's not allowed. So we think that's something that Congress ought to take another look at. Maybe the National Space Council can encourage a revisit to that issue, because this type of training can really help in terms of being prepared for your future space flights. So that's a quick look at things from the government perspective. We think the combination of the FAA licensing process and the informed consent regime that we're under has successfully balanced ensuring public safety while still allowing the innovation and creative design that we're seeing so much in industry. Someday we might need some additional regulations to respond to what we learn. In the meantime, love to see industry standards, sharing, mishap data when things go wrong, and cooperating on, on safety type issues, plus the kinds of training that we've been talking about here. So I look forward to your questions, but in the meantime, I got one for you, and that is, you ready to go? Thanks. Thank you, George. So George, just to, um, just to recap one question here for you, um, is there an FAA uh, certification process or anything to, um, I guess, what, what's the barrier? Can, can Virgin and Blue fly to space with or without FAA certification? So uh, under the law, any U.S. citizen or entity that wants to conduct the launch of a launch vehicle, including those with people on board, anywhere in the world needs to have an FAA license. And the only exception for that is for launches that are being conducted by and for the government. So NASA didn't need an FAA license when they flew the shuttle. The military doesn't need a license when they're doing their mission for national security. But anybody else does need to work with us. And of course, we've got a great partnership right now in working on the commercial crew program with NASA. We're focusing on the public safety aspect. NASA's focusing on the safety of its employees, NASA astronauts. And that partnership is working very well. And for the spaceflight participants that want to fly on board, they will just uh, need to sign a piece of paper. Is that correct? So they will have the informed consent that they'll have to agree to. Uh, our requirements in terms of the regulations are very minimal in terms of uh, egress training during emergencies and things like that. We're pretty much relying on the operators to decide what particular screening or medical uh, re requirements they want to put in place. Fantastic. Thank you. What about uh, a solution uh, that, that doesn't have a pilot, right? It's fully autonomous, it's just spaceflight participants. Can you have a whole crew of just informed consent and the, the first bullet about a license? Does that just go away if you don't so, have that role? So Blue Arch needs to have the license to do that launch, but there's no requirement to actually have a pilot on board. But if, if somebody is going to have the ability to change the trajectory, then there's some additional requirements on that person. Wonderful. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is, um, anyone remember the dating game way back in the day? All right. I'd like to invite a couple uh, students, uh, representative students that, ca that would uh, like to pose a couple questions. We want to date one of them and ask them which company you know, would, you, would you like to fly on and ask them sort of hard-hitting questions for them. So I'd like to, each of you guys to ask one question and um, I'm going to have you start. Okay, this is super this, this is, fun. This, so just, this is bachelor number one. <laughs> This is bachelorette number two, bachelor number three, bachelor number four, and bachelor number five. Just, okay, please. So this is really awesome, because as an astronaut, I guess, get asked a variant of this question all the time, and now I get to ask it. Uh, when I worked for George, and we were working on those guidelines and recommendations for human spaceflight, um, one of the things that we struggled with is that all of these companies are talking about extremely different time frames from minutes to, uh, Fergie, I don't know how long it takes to get to the station, but what the crew is in the vehicle for maybe 10 hours before they get to the station, something like that. Six to 24. Six to 24, okay. And then obviously, um, Tony, you were talking about you know days, weeks, and so forth. And uh, so as we were talking about those recommended guidelines, one of the things that we really struggled with was the habitability requirements. You know, what does the average person need um, to be um, physically healthy um, in certain bodily functions? So uh, my question is, 
um, what toilet facilities do you have planned and how long do uh, uh, people have to go uh, to wait? In other words, maybe you've made the decision, it's a short flight, you know, go before you launch and we're gonna save the wait, we don't need a potty, uh, and so forth, or maybe it's really okay, it's more like camping, Fergie, I don't know what kind of uh, facilities you might offer, and uh, Tony, I, I really hope you can answer this question, um, because when it becomes weeks, it's going to be a really big deal. So, um, please, let's start with the question. <laughs> there, we have many things to offer, but a good commode is not one of them. So there, there will not be a uh, bathroom uh, or a shower, for that matter, uh, on the uh, on the spaceship. New Shepard is pretty straightforward. Uh, at 11 minutes, we're going to load you onto the capsule about 30 minutes in advance of the flight, plus you know your your flight of about 10 minutes. We think uh, we think you guys will, will do just fine during that period without uh, without any facilities. We can't say that, can we? Um, <laughs> So six to 24 hours. Um, all right, since, since you, you, you took the, the conversation south very quickly, Pam, let's go there. Um, first, let's talk about human digestion, right? And we have number one and we have number two, right? Human digestion really doesn't, uh, it, it gets very confused when you go into orbit. So it, it, it will shut down and get very quiet for a long period of time. So we believe in our hearts that, that the number two portion of this activity is, is nothing to be worried about. By the time you get to the International Space Station, you'll have a nice warm toilet that you can use while you're there. Uh, with regard to, but we do provide for that, right? There is a provision for it in the form of the way that the Apollo crew did with it, right? Apollo bags, they used to call them. And for those of you out there uh, Wikipediaing this, you know, go, go look up an Apollo bag and it's a very interesting discussion. But, uh, but as far as urination is concerned, right, that, that's clearly got to happen. We do not have a toilet. However, we intend to use uh, uh, an ISS equivalent. Um, it's, uh, it's like a, I don't want to call it a catheter, but it does draw the urine away from your body. Uh, we will wear a diaper for asset and entry, but if you don't like to use a diaper while you're in orbit, we'll have a place for you to go to the bathroom, and it will be stored. Uh, odor free and leak free in a container that will be deposited uh, with the permission of the International Space Station program with them as a little present when we arrive. <laughs> and the same for the reverse trip. Yes, it's always good to bring a gift if you're showing up at somebody's house. <laughs> I thought it was polite. Um, yeah, so for, uh, again, for, uh, and again, uh, the early exploration missions, NASA, astronauts, at some point international partners, uh, Orion spacecraft, going to Deep Space Gateway, 30-day uh, kind of missions initially, and then building up to this uh, three-year uh, journey to Mars and back. Uh, so, yeah, hold it's not, not one of the answers. So the same... Uh, Ascent entry suits um, from a NASA perspective, the ACES, uh, they've got a modified version, but, um, but very similar. It just has some increased capability. Uh, but for this question, the same. A diaper on the, on the way up and the way back. And then the uh, Orion toilet, not just uh, being functional, it needs to be reliable, right? This is a, this is a critical piece of equipment. Whether it's humorous or not, it's, uh, it, it's one of the critical pieces of equipment. And so we, in collaboration uh, with the International Space Station program, of course, of course, all NASA is uh, testing today the reliability of the toilet that we will use on the Orion spacecraft. So um, it's one thing to, to build it, design it well, test it on the Earth. We're actually doing the zero G uh, long duration exposure testing on the International Space Station today. So in addition to fixing your bike, you're gonna have to fix the potty. Absolutely. And today there currently are no FAA regulations on waste management systems. <laughs> However, if you skim through those recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety, you will find that as one of the topics for things that should be thought through depending on your vehicle and your mission. And uh, Pambo, you'll be forever remembered as the first person on a first date to bring up the how do you go to the bathroom. <laughs> So I'm Jessica, I'm Australian, uh, and my question is for Bachelor number one and two. 
Uh, I'm looking to buy a family pass on one of your spacecraft, but I want to bring my seven-year-old grandmother and my five-year-old niece. So I'm wondering what kind of selection criteria there will be for commercial, uh, like um, tourists, basically. I think we can we can accommodate your seven-year-old grandmother, but I'm afraid the five-year-old niece will have to stay home for a few years. Uh, I think you have to be, George, remind me, it's 18, 18 to fly? Yeah, 18. 18 to fly. So other than that, as long as she's healthy, we'd love to have her. So why is that? Is because lawyers have thought about this and decided if you're going to give informed consent, then you need to be of the age that can make that kind of a decision. So don't anticipate that that's going to be the way it always is, but for right now, as we're trying this out, that's where we are. I would think as many people as raised their hand for wanting to ride on a rocket, I think if you are able to uh, sign an informed consent, you should be able to der derive the basic rocket equation from first principles, <laughs> or you're really not informed. So this is what we mean by normal people. <laughs> we, we don't want to have math on the exam. So, uh, batch number two? It's, it's the same response. We, we would love to take your, your seven-year-old grandmother, unfortunately, your, uh, uh, the five-year-old's going to wait a couple of years. Um, but for, for your seven-year-old grandmother, again, we have made a lot of uh, developments in the capsule to make sure that, that she will uh, not just... Uh, uh, enjoy the, the ride, but really do well and, and take in all that, that our flight has to offer. So. And providing daycare for the five-year-old <laughs> right there. We'll talk. That's part of the grander experience, sure. Hello, my name is uh, Joe Lozada. I'm from Portugal, now living in Germany. My question is for bachelor number three and four. And uh, I want you to think back before you had your first flight and think that you today had the choice to fly either Starliner or Orion, which one would you choose and why? Uh, and the answer is actually simple. They're both built to, uh, to NASA's very exacting standards, and NASA would not accept them for services unless they made it all the way through the verification process that ensures they're certified for safe for human flight. So I'd fly on either one. Yeah, and uh, the only difference is where would you get to go, right? I've, since I was young, I've, I've always wanted to step foot on Mars. So, uh, so I, I would choose Orion not from a worrying about the safety aspects, but from a, a getting to journey out into deep space. Chris, that was not really an answer, was it? <laughs> well, it, it depends what the mission is, right? The mission is to go to low Earth orbit. I'll take a star liner any day of the week. Um, I, I too would love to go to Mars. Though. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carmen Felix. I'm originally from Mexico, living in the Netherlands. My question is for Bachelor One and Five. So many of us here would like to go to space, right? But Tony was mentioning um, how many would like to go back, right, safely. So my question goes um, related to safety, which is a very important topic in uh, space tourism. Um, regarding the accident that happened in 2014 with the Spaceship 2, um, how will you convince just your customers about the safety of the Spaceship? And also, I would like your, your point of view. Um, related to reliability and redundancy of your uh, systems on board. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the accident, which was covered by our National Transportation Safety Board in exhaustive detail and hundreds and hundreds of papers, hundreds and hundreds of pages about the accident are available online if you want to go look at it. But the vehicle was operating absolutely flawlessly at the time of the accident. It was tragically an operator made a mistake. Um, I think the, uh, the NTSB pointed out that any mistake is a combination of you know, a human being and the machine letting the human being take that action. So we did respond, uh, and in the redesign, we, we have uh, prevented that accident from having happening again. But again, it gets back to the fundamental issue of understanding the level of risk. This is not like going on a long, uh, pleasant sea cruise. This is like climbing, you know, right now, the space flight is in such a state that this is like climbing a mountain, right? This is a very, this, this is a, 
a task that you should take, uh, a, a journey that you should take with your eyes open, and you should be apprised of all the risks. And, you know, astronauts have years and years of training. What George is trying to put in uh, to place is, is the basic tools that let passengers know the level of risk they're undertaking. So uh, we're going to make uh, the absolute safest vehicle that we can make, but when you're going to space, the difference between the safest you can make and safe is still going to be a considerable distance. So I think that's a, a great answer. In our regulations, we do require that the launch operators brief their prospective customers on not only the, the flight history, number of incidents and accidents and flights and so forth, but also some of the potential hazards. What kinds of things could go wrong and what are the potential consequences of that? So that is required and they will have an opportunity to ask any questions and hopefully it won't be deriving the rocket equation, but rather ex explaining what went wrong or what kinds of things could happen so that you at least go into this with your eyes wide open. It's going to be really exciting, but there's also risk involved and people need to understand that. Might I, might I add to that two points? So the informed consent, I think it's important and, and we, you know, we also take it very seriously, you can imagine, but it's not just this legal document. You have to write it in English that people understand and I think that's, that's really important uh, and I, I know you take it as seriously as we do. Um, but I think, and you should address the, the redundancy element in, in your question, um, that's also something that we take very seriously at Blue. should note that, you know, on New Shepard, uh, we build to two fault tolerance, right? So any two things can go wrong in the hardware and our customers are still going to be able to, uh, to return without serious injury. Uh, you build safety uh, and, and backup systems into, into the, the system. Um, I hope you all had an opportunity to see our last flight uh, uh, where we tested the escape motor, a solid rocket motor that got that capsule far and fast away from the booster. These are the types of things that you want to build into the system in advance, understanding that no matter how you build it, it's going to be risky, um, but it is our responsibility to do what we can to ensure that um, not only do you have a, a safe experience, but, uh, but, but a fun one as well, which includes having an element of a peace of mind going into it. Um, and I should also note that the first passengers on Blue will be, you know, we're going to fly some Blue Origin employees first uh, to make sure. Uh, I'm happy to join the, uh, the, the test people? dummy core yeah, exactly. um, uh, before we, we take our passengers up. Yeah, thank, thank you for the answer. Like, I think we all know that the space, the space sector is a risky um, thing. Um, and I thank you for, for the answer about the re redundancy, which I think it's very important for the passengers and customers to be aware that, of course, can be some mistakes, but there should be redundancy to avoid this mistake to produce a, a, a fatal accident, right? So thanks. Thanks a lot. Wow. Very good. Let's uh, give a round of applause <laughs> for that I think we, we can all agree that space is, uh, is, is risky, but we're all still dreamers and, um, and we all want to go. So uh, stay there for one moment. I'm taking a selfie. Uh, and I'd like all you guys to turn around and be in this. This is going to be a hashtag, what did you call it? Oop. What did you call the bags? Apollo bags. Apollo bags. Hashtag Apollo bags. Everyone, one, two, three. All right. Thank you.